Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Would you welcome someone who needs no further introduction, our Chancellor Chuck Swindoll. Thank you. Good morning. It was more than a ransom, a random passing thought on my part when I asked the chaplain to lead us in the singing of that grand hymn this morning. I wanted to watch you as you sang it, and uh, I, I wanted to get the sense that you were understanding what you were saying in the uh, melody and the rhythm of that grand hymn. A serious message, isn't it? Just a few reminders of what you just sang. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft, his power, are great. They're armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. It went on to say that he is the prince of darkness grim. But his rage we can endure. Those are powerful words aren't they? His craft, his power, his hate, his rage, and you and I are the target. I realize that this is a high water mark for some of you sitting in this chapel today, and I rejoice with you. Sincerely, I do. And we do welcome you who are coming to join ranks with us. We're honored to have you numbered among us. I mean those words uh, sincerely. But I fear for you. It is just like the enemy to hit us when we are up, just as he does when we are down. And as we look into God's word to find one of his choice spokesmen brought to his knees and finally on his face, asking for the Lord to take him, I'm reminded all over again that uh, uh, on earth is not his equal, but in heaven is. One man puts it like this, fits of depression come over the most of us. The strong are not always vigorous. The wise not always ready. The brave not always courageous. The joyous not always happy. He continues, the biographies of eminent ministers prove that seasons of fearful prostration have fallen to the lot of most, if not all of them. The life of Luther might suffice to give a thousand instances, and he was by no means of the weaker sort. His great spirit was often in the seventh heaven of exaltation and as frequently on the borders of despair. His very deathbed, the man writes, was not free from tempests and he sobbed himself 
into his last sleep like a great wearied child. Discouragement, disillusionment, and depression go hand in hand. They are the triple demons that haunt those who stand in the gap. If you will one day be one of God's spokesmen, you are one of those who stand in the gap, and I warn you years ahead of time of these demons that will haunt you. They will attack you when you least expect them to come, and they will bring you to your knees. They'll bring you to your face. And you will, on occasion, wonder if you can go on. They won't wait until you're away from this place. They'll attack you while you're here. They'll hit you hard, and they'll hit you below the belt. And they'll fight you, and they will do their best to bring you down and make you run away from your calling rather than toward it. I warn you, listen to me today. Your future will be fraught with those times like Moses felt when he was of all things, <laughs> disillusioned. And he lost uh, the direction of his calling, albeit momentarily, but he lost it. And, and then, then there was Jeremiah, who could have written some of his works with tears, not with ink. There was David coming back to Ziklag, I just read of it late last night. Coming back to Ziklag with fellow warriors and their tents had been burned, their wives had been taken, their children kidnapped. And the verse says in 1 Samuel 30, they all lifted up their voices and they wept. And then on top of that, the men spoke of mutiny against David. In the midst of all of them losing wives and children, not knowing if they'd ever see them again, thanks to the dreaded Amalekites, they spoke of, of stoning David. He didn't set the tents on fire. He was one of them. No wonder they all lifted up their voices and wept. And then I just read this morning in 2 Corinthians 1 that the Apostle Paul in Asia at some point, doesn't specify where, despaired even of life. The last four words of verse 8 in 2 Corinthians 1. And I didn't even mention John the baptizer, who when he was incarcerated wondered if this really is the true Messiah. Could this really be the one that we were, the one I baptized, really the one? Disillusioned, discouraged, depressed. There they are again. Did you hear those names? Luther, Moses, Jeremiah, David, Paul. Spurgeon reserves an entire chapter of his lectures to my students. Chapter 11, 11 and a half pages in my volume, and they're worn thin with wear. I've read them over and over again. He, he reserves that chapter to what he calls the minister's fainting fits and admits to it. Freely and openly and vulnerably says that he is given to melancholy. Spurgeon, another great name, and I could name others right down the line. Your name will be on the list. Mine is in the list. 
Every man or woman on this platform is in the list. Why? Because on earth is not his equal. I like it that James, when he writes of Elijah, says he was a man with a nature just like ours. James 5, 17. So it's that man we're looking at today in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah, one of our heroes. Every time we go to Israel, we visit Carmel and if you've not been there, you'll be there someday and, and you'll read the inscription and you'll see the place. The place of grand victory, great victory over the prophets of Baal. And you've read the story in 1 Kings 18 of the, that altar and the prophets of Baal couldn't get any action. And, and Elijah, in inc incredible courage, standing against the, the great majority of the prophets, all those people around him. And, and, he, and he has the audacity to call on the God of heaven to, to bring down fire, having filled the altar with water. And, and fire came, and, and then he says, with equal courage, uh, uh, take their lives, and he kills every one of them. Good riddance. And then he stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with Ahab and and runs, of all things, pulls up his tunic and runs 17 miles from Carmel to Jezreel. And it's a high water mark, and he, he comes there uh, on, the, on the heels of that victory. Just as some of you come to seminary, it, it, is the, it is the ultimate answer to prayer for you. You have waited, you have prayed, God has provided, and here you are, finally, to study under these men and women of whom the world isn't worthy, great minds, inspired text, magnificent history, over 80 years of people just like you and me sitting here, taking it in, learning, growing, being mentored, challenged, reproved, disciplined, all the while, the enemy is just waiting for the moment. He's been studying you since you were born. He knows your secret thoughts. He knows your every, every passing fancy. He knows you. He is waiting for the moment to strike. This prince of darkness, grim. And he strikes our friend Elijah, who, who seems invulnerable. He, he seems stronger than human when you get to the beginning of this chapter. Elijah told uh, eight, uh, verse 19, uh, verse 1, chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Now, uh, Ahab is your classic weak willed husband. He, uh, so he runs to this dominating wife. Jezebel, and she just can't wait to do the king's work her way. And she's going to take matters in her own hands. I don't think, this is, a, this, is, this is a speculation, I don't think Elijah ever thought that uh, he'd encounter Jezebel. Ahab is the enemy, as he thought. But out of the blue, when you do not expect it to come from some source, count on it, that'll be the source. It'll hit you on the blind side. You wouldn't think it'd come from that person or this situation. And, and uh, sort of out of the blue, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, 
so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. That is called a threat. <laughs> and um, Elijah understands that. You probably have never been threatened. You will be. Uh, maybe not with your life, but you'll be threatened. You'll, you'll, you'll be threatened. B because if, if there's anybody who, who can't stand uh, spiritual strength, it's weak-willed husbands and dominating wives. It's carnal people. It, it's folks who operate in the flesh. You'll encounter them, and they won't appreciate you. They'll resent you. How dare you stand against what my husband stands for? How dare you do what you did in public? And unfortunately, her words become more important to this great man of God than even the memory of a victory recently passed. The power of his God to do what he did. But verse 3 tells us the beginning of his fall. First, he was afraid. I have in the margin of my Bible a little kind of downward steps like this, where I put the verb on each line, horizontal line, afraid, ran, sat down. Pray, take my life. Look at it. He was afraid, rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. You can't go much further than Beersheba. <clears throat> That's a long way from Jezreel. As I figured, about 100 miles. So he's already run 17. So he races down, gets away as far as he can to Beersheba, which belongs to uh, Judah, and he left his servant there. Another mistake. He gets all alone. Usually when we're discouraged, depressed, disillusioned, we, we draw the shades, lock the doors, pull up to ourselves, and we don't ask anybody for help. Bad decision. But we tend to do that. And, and he's running for his life, and he goes to Beersheba, and, and he leaves the servant. Verse 4 tells us he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he goes even deeper. And you haven't seen wilderness like you until you get to Beersheba and points beyond. I remember my first trip to Israel. Uh, I was with Charlie Dyer, a former faculty member here. And I, 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 I'm on the bus and Charlie's sitting across from me. And we're down into Judah. And I said to him, wow, look at this. There were a little scrub brush here and a little brush there and Dead Sea off to the left. And I said, man, look at this wilderness. He said, not yet. Not yet. I mean, look at that. He said, yeah, but you can still see green. Just wait. Just wait. Got a little further south. And very little bit of green and all gravel and rock and, and, and rugged, barren mountains and dry and hot. I said, man, look at this wilderness. Not yet. Not yet. Still see a little green. Still see a little water. And we went a little further and we saw wilderness like you can't imagine. Oh, I, I traveled from Southern California to Needles, so I thought I'd seen wilderness. But I'm telling you, this southern part of Judah is barren, just like Elijah's soul. He gets way deep into the wilderness, and he sat down, under a broom tree, juniper tree, and he, he requested for himself that he might die. You know who this is? This is the same one who said earlier, call down fire of the Lord, bring it on the altar. And fire comes down and he stands toe to toe against the king. See that? And the, the, the prophets are all slain. Now he's the same guy saying, take my life. 
Right now, you can't imagine having a thought like, maybe some of you can. Let me, let me be a little more accurate here. Maybe some of you have been there. There have been a few times in my life when I've, I've uh, thought that. Thankfully, not many. Some struggle with it a lot. They really do. Some of your parishioners will. You'll talk to some that will talk to you about suicide, and, and, and you'll just talk your heart out. You'll just pray with them, and you, you just keep them in contact so they won't do it. You get in touch with a doctor. You get them in counseling. You, you hope to help them in their, in their struggle. And boom, in the middle of the night, the phone rings, and they took their life. A month ago, it happened right in, in the family in our church. Darling woman, not even yet 30, on her way up in the space industry, a oh, great future, and, and just love the Lord, involved in the church, active, engaged in, in the life of the, of the family of God, made a move. It looked like she was on her way up. The next move would either be Seattle or Los Angeles. She was at the top of her career, master's degree, finished college in two and a half years, master's in a year, brilliant. Took more pills than I could describe, and finally, with a nine millimeter, blew her brains out. And I held that mother and that father in my arms at their kitchen, and I and I told them, I couldn't imagine what that would be like to go what they're going through. Somehow, in the midst of it, the, the, the demons won. And she, and she succumbed. Listen to me today. You need all the truth from the word of God that you can pack into your brain. You need, you need to give yourself wholly to this time you have here. Take your time. Let it sink in. Take it in. Don't get cynical. Don't get smart. Stay humble. Stay submissive. Listen. This is a lifeline place. This is, your, this is your life. You'll never be back here again. This is your moment. Elijah has nobody around him. You're surrounded by him. You're, you've got him by the hundreds around you. And, and take advantage of it. Just learn to pray, learn to trust, learn to wait on him. Lean hard, not on your own understanding. Learn what it is to release your own will to his. And, and let the wonder in. Let the magnificence of theology take over. Let the truth lodge deeply in your life. Learn to relate to others in this process of becoming whole, wholly a woman of God, a man of God. Let it happen. Because this prince of darkness, Grim, is after you. Someday you will be alone in a barren place and the one who changes the times and the seasons will determine this will be a, a, a time that will be hard and the season will be barren. And the enemy will hit you with both barrels. I know what I'm talking about. And it will come from sources you would never have expected. He lay down. I think verse 5 begins with a hope that he would not ever wake up. The thought of suicide apparently never entered his mind. Thank the Lord. Unthinkable for a prophet of God to take his life. And so he says, Lord, you do it. Just stop the heart. Don't let me wake up. And he lay down. And he slept. And this, this is a beautiful response. I want you to get this. 
And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said, Arise, eat. Isn't that just like the Lord? <laughs> you know our style. What in the world is the matter with you, Elijah? Don't you realize what I just did for you just hours ago? None of that. Or worse, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And you just ought to be. That always helps, by the way, to say that. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I mean, look at all I've done for you. None of that. He sends an angel and he says, Elijah, wake up. I got a hot meal here. He looked and behold, there was at his head a baked, a, a, a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he <laughs> lay down again. Well, at least I can die full. And he lies back down. But it's not a plan to take his life. It's a plan to give him recovery. Sometime in the midst of this discouragement and depression and disillusionment, the best thing you can do is have a great period of rest. Often we think we need to work harder, need to go faster. Not necessarily. Sometimes it's because you've been going too hard and too fast and too long. There's no rebuke. There's just a gracious, here's the meal, eat it. Taste it. Maybe he had eaten, eaten for a long time. I know this, he had run a long ways and he had traveled a long ways. And in the midst of depression and disillusionment, discouragement, you don't eat like you should. You don't rest like you should. You don't get your sleep like you should. I think it was the founder of our school that said, sometimes, sometimes a good night's sleep is more important than reading another chapter of the scriptures. Just a good night's sleep. And, and uh, so he, he was allowed to, to rest. Verse 7, the angel came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat. The journey is too great for you. Isn't that just like the Lord? <laughs> I love that. Sometime enough is enough. Sometime enough is too much. You've been going at it too hard. It's too much for you, Elijah. By the way, I, I'm, I must warn you, the enemy knows that your most vulnerable moments come often on the heels of a great victory. Some of you are on the, on the, uh, on the cusp of it. The victory is, is upon you. Others of you are just at the edge where the precipice is right in front. And, and from a great, great moment, uh, that's why I think shortly after a wedding, couples sometimes drop into a depression. Drop into a time of disillusionment. Good night. He doesn't seem like the guy I was dating. Uh, or oh, she doesn't look as good next morning as she always looked on our date. And, and uh, all kinds of stuff. Your mind plays tricks on you. Uh, two weeks after getting into your, into your new pastorate. Wow. Honeymoon's over. Uh, I'm about ready to be involved in Mark Young's inauguration at, at, at Denver, and, and, and we all applaud that. And uh, I've already talked to Mark more than once, and I've, you know, he probably don't want to talk to him more because I'm warning him about this. I said, you got to know, man. Uh, it, it, you, you're going to drop hard, and reality's going to hit you right in the face. So, so be ready. And, and here's Elijah. He wasn't ready for what would come. So the Lord very graciously is, is nurturing him and nourishing him. Now finally, verse 8, he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. You take your map and look that up. That's another 200 uh, crazy miles south into more wilderness to Horeb. Wasn't that where God spoke to Moses? Do you wonder, as I do, if the cave where he winds up was awfully close to where God gave the, 
gave the, the law. Maybe he thought that would be a place. There's, there's something significant about finding the right place in recovery, and that's another sermon. He came there, verse 9, to a cave, and he lodged there. <laughs> cave. <laughs> was under a tree, and now he's in a cave. Oh. There's an old hymn that says, it just comes to mind, How tedious and tasteless the hour, when Jesus no longer I see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, and sweet flowers have lost their sweetness to me. The midsummer sun shines but dim. The fields strive in vain to look gay. When I'm happy in him, December's as pleasant as May. But those hours are tedious and tasteless because the times get hard and the seasons get barren. You wind up in a cave. <laughs> so the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, look at the end of verse 9. What are, you, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I, I, th I think those are words of compassion. You know, they weren't rebuked. Like, what in the world are you doing in there? It was, Elijah, what are you doing here? In other words, how could you best spend your time? Now that you've taken the time to rest, now that you've been nourished a little, what are you doing here? And look at his response. He's still low, lower in a whale's belly. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. Oh, man. This, this is another step down. This is called the reprehensible self-pity. Oh, woe is me. Time to eat worms. I'm at the bottom. I'm all alone. You're not alone, but you feel alone. That's an attack from the enemy. The enemy wants you to think you're alone. He wants you to think you're the only one in that region that's speaking of Christ. You're not. He wants you to think you're the only witness. You're not. He wants you to think if you don't leave school early and get out there and evangelize, the whole world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. No, it won't. You need time here. You need years here. You need more years than you're required to be here. <laughs> How's that for an encouraging thought? <laughs> you need this place. This is a refuge. This is a place, a harbor. This is a place where your ship is docked. It's getting... It's getting supplied because you're going to be out there and those storms are wild. I alone am left. There's nobody else. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord very graciously reminds him that uh, he has thousands who've never bowed the knee. You, you know the story. The thing I love in the whole part of this is verse 12. There was the sound of a gentle blowing. Oh, my. Needed that sound in my life. <laughs> a gentle blowing. The presence of the living God. Surely his presence is in this place. Feel the brush of angel wings. See glory on each face. Surely he's in this place. I can tell you in my own life, there are three times when I tend to drop low First is when things I believe should never happen occur. Fine, godly, 
young person you visit with in the hospital, you work with the family, you care for them, he dies. That drive home is the longest drive of my day, sometime of my month. And I say, Lord, why on earth did he die? A lady listening to our, ref our radio message one day wrote us a note. Cynthia just read it the other day to me. And, and I, I'd spoken apparently on something about storms, riding out a storm or something. And she said, I hung on every word. And she said, little did I know by the time I got home, I discovered that my just married daughter had been brutally murdered. Murdered! This godly woman just living in the delight of the Lord and gets home and the and bottom drops out of her life. Pool of blood. There's a graduate of Dallas Seminary whose brother was shot. And, and, and they finally felt they found the killer, then he slipped away. And 20 years passed, 20 years of searching and waiting. And the, the case got cold. And, and John told me not long ago, he said, and, and you know what? We found him. Finally found him. Justice is going to roll down. And on a technicality, he's, he's gotten out of the, the whole thing, even though he had said he had done it. And as a murderer on the street because of a legal technicality, that drops me low. Second, when things I'm convinced should and will happen, don't. Kind of the reverse side of that coin. Parents say goodbye to their daughter at the, at the, at the uh, airport. She's in uniform, trained, ready, uh, in a great outfit, on her way, doesn't come home. And we all were there to say goodbye, but she doesn't come home. And she's killed with friendly fire on top of that. That makes me low. I can't figure it out. I can't understand the sovereign plan. And the fact is, I don't have the equipment to get it. I never will. So that's when I trust and tell him, I leave it with you. Third, when I believe things should happen right now, just right now, and it don't happen till way, way, way later, later. God's word is wait. I don't like that word. I like now. Yeah, like right now. John, Scotty, you understand. I think wait is probably the hardest assignment God gives his people. Every person in here, every person here is waiting for something. If I were to take the time to tell you what I'm waiting for, it'd make your mouth drop open. Bailey knows, but most of you don't. It'd be a great day in my life when that happens. I wished it would have happened day before yesterday, really last month. Way, way down the line, it's going to happen. Until then, the Prince of Darkness, Graham, would love to get me and break my heart and break my spirit and stop my voice. And he could. If I forget one little word shall fell him. The master is the triumphant king of kings. Let's bow together. Thank you, Father, that you are the mighty God, the everlasting, the Father of eternity, that your Son is the Prince of Peace. Always, always more powerful than the Prince of Darkness, grim. Thank you for your presence that fills this place. Thank you for the ministering work of those angels who in cooperation with the Holy Spirit moves among us 
invisibly and invincibly. We worship you, our God. In the name of the Savior, our Lord. Everybody said, 